Hello, Water Christ, and welcome back. So good to be with you, and so good to have you join us. We are so excited for this week as we continue on on our series of Unending Grace. This is week 19 of this series, and just when you think we've covered everything that there could cover about grace, we come to an even deeper understanding of how much more there is to this topic in this, in this category of grace, this principle of grace. And so I want to encourage you as we head down this home stretch, we have a few more sessions on this teaching of unending grace. I'm going to encourage you to remain focused and stay with us and continue to track with us as we zero in on some powerful principles about unending grace. This week, Rose is with us and we look at how grace helps us understand our identity, the connection between grace and our identity in God. And it is powerful. And so uh, we're so glad to have you with us. And as a reminder, stay with us after the teaching. We come back, we summarize what we believe the Spirit of God is showing to us, showing us through this teaching. So God bless you, family. Enjoy this. Open your heart. Open your mind. I trust the Spirit of God will speak to you and will bless you in this teaching. We'll see you on the other side. Hello everyone, my name is Rose Romandi and welcome back to the Unending Grace. In this video, we are going to redefine grace again one more time and basically nail it in our understanding, in our mind. So it just it's just such a powerful concept in the New Testament. And this morning when I woke up and I was getting ready to record the video today, I was just receiving so loads of revelation on grace. And believe me, I've studied grace hours upon, upon hours and it's interesting that every single time that we go to grace we visit the grace object something new opens up for us and that's that's why it makes it so alive and powerful so for so long basically uh, we were told that grace is receiving what we don't deserve so hopefully by now as you have gone through the uh, series of the unending grace that on that basically definition of grace is already wiped out in your understanding or in your mind but today we are going to see it even from to understand that grace is actually our identity it defines who we are so turn with me to hebrews chapter 2 and um and let's read this verse and once for all we want to understand what grace is in this verse so this is one of the most important verses for myself every single time i want to define grace i come to this verse and hopefully it's going to open up for you today as well so let's go to hebrews chapter 2 and let's take a look at verse 9 together it says but we see jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. So do you just see here? It says, by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. So that's really, that's a definition of the grace we have here. The grace of God is that he, might taste death for everyone okay so let me share my screen here maybe we should just ro jump right into the screen because it's always easier to see and to draw and break down every verse so here says therefore the grace of god the grace of god is oh okay so <laughs> all right so the grace of god is that he might taste death for everyone so if you pay attention i just put um, a little more space between three things here he tasted death for everyone so and this is called the grace so first of all the grace of god has nothing to do did you just see in this verse has nothing to do with me in that verse, it says the grace of God is that he tasted for me. Okay, so therefore, the grace of God is that he did something for me. 
okay so what we were like under the law or let's put the definition of the law so the law is I do for me so this is what happened this is a difference between the law and the grace so the law puts you into the focus did you just see I do it but the grace says he did it so now this is just this is that understanding and I want you to if you can pause the video and just chew on it if we believe that grace is I receive because I didn't deserve it but grace of God gave it came to me because I didn't deserve it but I receive it do you see the focus is still me 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 this is this is what the corruption this is how the corruption came to the world going back to Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve they ate from the tree their eyes were open and they saw themselves and they kept saying I I I I so one of the roots of death <laughs> and the corruption is the I I I part of this story instead of he 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 so instead of looking at me we must lift up our eyes and we looked at him so now let's again understand what just understand this the grace of God grace means that God did something for you but the moment you come to understand to, to the law it's that I do something for myself so so therefore if you take a look at here Therefore, what we can do is in the law, under the law, so when we did something for ourselves, what we did became who we are. So basically, we defined our identity on based of what we did. So basically, we say you are or I am, do you see? I am what I do. So what does that mean? That means what we do defines our identity. So do you remember when Jesus went to the wilderness to be tempted by the devil? So the, the, the devil came and said, if you are the son of God, then do something about it. So if you are the son of God, so turn the stones to bread do something so that so therefore that doing identifies and proves your identity okay so that's what it's there's this narrow line there is this um you know switch must happen in our understanding so the devil came basically and told jesus that okay you say you are the son of God then do it turn the stone to bread and when you do that and that work that you do then that defines who you really are and this is what exactly happened to Adam and Eve in Genesis and to every single one of us to this day that we are sitting we try to prove who we are by doing the things this is how the world works this is how every single religion works your deeds your works define who you are but this is the corruption that came to the world this is actually the law of sin and death that works in every single one of us that's why there is so much corruption is happening because we are walking around and we are trying to do things and because I do it then I can have something so now I have to have a little disclaimer here just in case this is the first time you are watching this video I am not saying it is okay to do the bad things no I'm not saying this what I'm saying is your identity doesn't come from what you do okay why am I saying this if have you ever done something and then you regretted it I'm sure you did because I did and we all lived in Adam and this is the nature of Adam 
If you ever did something and you regretted it, that means that thing is not who you are because you regretted the thing that you did. And the moment you realize that what you did is not who you are, that's when you become free and step into that grace that we have. So now going back to the Genesis part and the story of Abel and Cain, and for those of you who listened to the um, God's Master Plan series that we had a few months ago, in the story of Cain and Abel, so God came to Cain after he killed his brother and he asked him, okay, why are you hiding yourself basically from me? And Cain is start condemning himself and he says, now I am be a vagabond on earth and I'll be cursed and da 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 because my punishment is great and because I killed my brother. So he took an identity upon himself because of something he did. And then it says the Lord put a mark on him so that no one would kill Cain. Even though Cain counted himself worthy of death because of what he did to his brother, God didn't. God didn't count him worthy of death. That's why he put a mark on Cain so no one can kill him. Why? Because there is the grace of God that defines every man and identity of every man that we are going to see it today. So therefore, grace is what he did for me and the law is what I do for me. One brings life and one brings death. Both of them defines our identity. Why? Because when you come to the grace, basically, if he did for me, then I must be something. So I'm going to show you the verse, but let me write it down here. So the grace says now, I am who I am. Okay, so this is the two different different understanding of our, the identity. If you know yourself according to what you do, you're going to say, I am what I do. But if you know yourself according to the, what God did for you, you're going to say, I am who I am. Okay, so let me show you actually the verse. So if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and 1 Corinthians chapter 15, our brother Paul here is actually saying the same thing. Look at verse 1 Corinthians 15, uh, look at verse 10. It says, by the grace of God, I am what I am, or I am that I am, okay? Do you know that this is the exact wordings or the phrase that God used to introduce himself to Moses? So in Exodus chapter 3, when God appeared to Moses, he, Moses asked him, who are you? And God said, I am that I am. Okay, so now Paul is actually saying the same thing that God said to Moses. And then he says, by the grace of God, I am that I am. Do you see? Paul says, okay, the grace of God is defining for me, I am that I, I am. I am not what I do, okay? So now, usually in the mind of a religious mindset, basically, this is blasphemy. You know, God is the great I am. And now Paul comes here and says, I am. Okay, and I remember for myself, when I read this verse, it sounded so blasphemous because oh he is the great I am but we must understand this that everything God is let me let me say this you want to write it down somewhere hopefully you have your pen and pencil or whatever ready write it down whatever God is and whoever he is is your true identity okay so the sun is the manifestation of God. The sun is the visible image of the invisible God. So Jesus walked around and Jesus said, I do what, my, I, what I see my father is doing. 
I am what my father is basically if you see me you have seen the father so what are we seeing here and you know usually I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna stretch you a little and hopefully you incline your ear to hear what the spirit says okay we are not here to exalt man to be a god okay we are here to find who we are because we are in him okay so now i want to stretch your understanding a little here and to to say this to you every manifestation of who god is every time god showed himself to someone in the old testament in the new testament in the person of jesus christ it's the revelation of who you really are okay so now what are we seeing here what we see when god came to moses and said i am that i am it was a revelation of who moses actually is it was a revelation of who the man in christ is it was the revelation of the man that god is mindful of him who we really are and you know years and years we took upon ourselves the false identity of adamic nature and when we come to the true understanding of who we are we freak out <laughs> because we are like oh this is blasphemy and while this is not this is revealing the true nature of who we are and the reason is that you can actually start living in it okay if you are a king of a kingdom somewhere but you don't know about it then you are not gonna reign and you're not gonna be the king and you're not gonna do anything you're gonna live probably like a beggar and not like a king right so therefore if you don't know who you are you will never live it you will never experience it and that's what the gospel is talking about paul says here to us i am that i am by the grace of god so what does that mean that means the grace of god is my identity the great what god is doing for me is who i am not what i do for myself okay so many times you and i have asked questions like this okay uh you know what do i need to do now or how am i going to supposed to do it and i i i i is the focus of everything that we do and the gospel is 180 percent degree opposite of this concept the gospel is not about i i i i the gospel is about he 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 so as long as you are focused on okay how am i supposed to do this how am i measuring this i i i you have lost the sight of who he is why because the moment you see him he becomes that identity to you and then you find yourself living in a life that you actually are supposed to live so now let me just take you to hebrews chapter 2 again and let's take a look here so we just read in chapter in verse 9 that by the grace of god he tasted death for everyone so based on first of all the grace of god did something for me okay so grace of god is he did something for me i am because he did it okay so write it down grace is this i am because he did something for me and i remember when i you know there was a time in the beginning of my christian life i would just go out praying for people and and i remember i came home one day and i was you know i was like okay what's wrong with me you know i need to so i'm supposed to have faith and when i was praying for people i was more focused on my faith and my prayer and my words and my i wanted to become me i i want to make sure that everything i do is biblical and i want to make sure i i i right so and i remember i came home and uh, you know i was really frustrated because i thought something's wrong with me because i'm praying for people nothing is happening what's wrong with me what do i need to do god now if you finish this why am i am i not seeing it happening okay and the lord take me to these verses look at verse 9 what did we see here it says but we see jesus okay so this is the important but why is it saying but we see jesus look at verse 8 the verse before that 
sometimes I read the Bible backward, okay? <laughs> so it's gonna help us to understand what's happening here. So look at look at verse eight. It says, you have put all things in subjection under his feet. Okay, so if, we, if you don't continue reading this, you think that it's talking about Jesus here, okay? So you put all things in subjection under his feet. Let's continue reading. And it says, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. So let's, let's wait here. By the time you get here, you probably think still that he's talking about Jesus because everything is under the feet of Jesus, which is the truth. But this verse is not talking about Jesus only. Why? Because when when the writer of the Hebrews is reading this, he understood that it's talking about man. Look at that. Let's continue reading. But now, we do not see all things put under him. Oh, okay. So now, it says, okay, guys, he put all things in subjection to him, but we don't see him, everything in subjection to him. So now, who is this him? Let's go back to verse 6. Verse 6 says, But one testified in certain place saying, What is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you take care of him. Okay? So you have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hand. You have put all things in subjection to his feet. So therefore, the person in the focus of this concept lines here is the man okay so so there verse 8 says we we don't see everything is subject under the man him this man that god is mindful of him right but now look at verse 3 it says but we see jesus did you just see what happened he says guys it comes to a time in our lives that we don't see everything in subjection to the man that we are, okay? Because he brings himself into the picture. He says, we, that man that God, God is talking about, that everything is subject to him, but we don't see it, is which man? I see it in my life. When I look at Jesus, everything is under his feet. But when I look at my life, not everything is under my feet, okay? So Paul here says, therefore, we see Jesus. Did you just see? There is a shift of perspective is happening. Lifting your eyes from what is not subjecting to you to the one whose everything is subject to him. Why? Because all of a sudden, there is a new identity comes to the picture. So verse 9 says, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, by the grace of God might taste death for everyone. Now, look at the next verse. It's a most powerful verse. It says, for it was fitting for him for whom all are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Okay, hold on. Bringing many sons to glory through the one who suffered. Verse 9 told us the one who suffered was who? Jesus. We see Jesus who suffered the death. Are you following here with me? Therefore, do you see grace? He suffered so that he can lead the sons to the glory. How, how, is it suffer how is it happening? The verse before that told us grace of God made him suffer for everyone. So how the leading is happening there? If you read in the context, the leading of sons to the glory is through grace, right? Because he suffered for you. And that's the grace of God that comes to you and leads you to the glory. But I want you to circle the word sons here. Okay. Did you see verse 
8 and 9 says we don't see it, we don't see it, we, we, we. Okay, verse 9 says, but we see Jesus. It's interesting. Circle the word we in verse 9 and circle the word sons in verse 10. Did you just see? There is a transition of identity from a place of, oh, we don't see things under our feet into the transition of you are a son that is being led to the glory. So, so therefore, the moment you see Jesus, okay, the one who suffered and da, 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 amazing stuff, then you realize, oh my gosh, everything that just happened, it was, he did it for me, and that's the grace of God. Because I must be something that I don't know I am. Let me put it this way. I must be worthy to receive it. Verse 10 says, it was fitting for him. It was fitting for God. He had to do this because, because you are one with him. You are receiving it, not because you don't deserve it, because actually you do deserve, deserve it. Why? Because you are one with him. You are part of him. You are his bone, his flesh. I told you, whoever he is, is who you are because you are one with him. Okay? And now, I want to show the next verse, but we had sometimes we have people like, okay, so you can't really say that because that really makes us uh, God manifested in flesh. And I'm like, yeah. This is the gospel. You are supposed to be God seen in flesh. This is the glory of God. This is what God is working. God wants to show himself in you, in your life, in your thoughts, in your words, in the expression of your eyes, in your um, laughing, in your crying, in your body, in your whatever. Everything that you are, he, want, he wants to be dripped. <laughs> he wants to be seen in it. So now look at this. Look at verse 11. It says, for both he who sanctifies, okay, who, is, who sanctifies the one who died and those who are being sanctified, who are those who are being sanctified, those who are being led to the glory, So those, both who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. So it was fitting for him. You were worthy of the death of Jesus. You were worthy of the receiving of the grace. You were, you are worthy of the grace of God. So here says why, because this person who is sanctifying you, and the person who is being sanctified, they are of one. Okay, now the question is, what is this one here? And how does this sanctification is happening? Look at this. They are of one. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So did you just see that? They are of one of father. They are one from a, a father because he who sanctifies and he who is being sanctified, they are brothers. So that means they are from one father. Okay. Did you just see what happened? It says, okay, it was actually fitting for him to do whatever he did because you were worthy of him because you were out of, you came out of him. So now... I want to ask you this question and probably maybe this is the perfect place for me to end this video and leave you with this discussion around this subject. The one who is sanctifies and those who are being sanctified, what, what is he sanctifying with and how are he sanctifying people? I'm going to give the answer, but I want you to do the discussion in your home groups or with whoever you can or you want is this, that those 
who he who sanctifies the verse before that he told us how he sanctifies he sanctifies through the suffering of death because he became perfected the verse before that the suffering of death is actually the grace of god how is he sanctifying he he sanctifies the sons of god by the grace of god how are you becoming sanctified by the grace so grace is what sanctifies you from what from i am what i am to cleanse you from i am what i do i'm sorry so grace cleanses your identity cleans clean makes your conscience wiped clean from believing of i am what i do into i am what i am so the he's sanctifying the sons of god through the grace he's leading them into the glory because they are being washed clean from the false identity of i am what i do to the true identity of i am so and that's how when you believe this when you realize no i am because of what he did that's when you step into the greater experience of the identity and so many people have asked us before or you know i asked this from myself until this concept of grace started opening up for us and i told you the story what why why is it that i pray and it didn't happen and after i had the revelation of this i realized that i don't care anymore why it didn't happen i need to know why it must happen because that brings you into the true identity i don't ask questions anymore why it didn't happen why i'm not seeing things under my feet if you are still there you're still in verse 8 you need to move on to verse 9 and 10 and further okay so we need to shift and switch and on our eyes and realize that okay i i don't care about why it didn't happen but i need to know why it must happen because i see jesus and now i realize that this grace of god is cleaning me is sanctifying me from the false mentality of why it didn't happen to why it must happen or i am what i do to i am what he says i am basically all right guys so now maybe this is the good place for you to do your uh, discussion to talk about it to understand that how this how grace brings the sanctification into your life what are the other other false beliefs do you still believe that grace needs to sanctify and cleanse that all right guys thank you so much and i will see you in the next video welcome back family thank you rose for bringing us this teaching it was so good as we took a close look at understanding our identity through grace and how grace reveals our identity in God. And so we have some, some powerful points to leave with you as we get to it. Um, and so let's get going. In the first point that I think it's important for us to take away on this teaching is this, is by the grace of God, Jesus tasted death for everyone. This is a central provision of grace. And I love this because it doesn't say that Jesus tasted death for those that repeat a certain prayer. It doesn't say that Jesus tasted death for those that go through a certain church of those of a certain denomination. It said that Jesus tasted death for everyone by the grace of God. And so let's read this in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. It says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. And so we see that we come to understand grace as the means by which that Jesus um, tasted death on behalf of everyone so that we may live and we may move into eternal life. The second point is this is the law places you and your works at the center of focus. And by contrast, grace puts Christ and his works at the center of focus. 
And we see this um, in clearly in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, when we started to read this, um, it starts this, the verse by saying, but we see Jesus. And when you see the scripture refers to grace, you'll start to see the focus come off of us and what we do. And, and the focus becomes on Jesus. And this is why the definition of grace can't have your qualification or my qualification or your behavior be part of the equation. It can't be part of the math. Grace can't mean getting something that you don't deserve because that definition of grace still makes grace a reaction to your behavior. It still starts with your behavior. It still looks at you when in fact, grace is only determined by the one who is extending it and is completely unrelated to what you may or may not deserve. Grace is God doing something, period. The law is you doing something. Under the law, you and your works are the determining factor, whereas under grace, God is the determining factor. That is so good and so liberating. And let's move on to the third point. It says this, the temptation of Christ in the wilderness was the same temptation that Eve faced in the garden. It was the, the temptation to be deceived about their identity. It was the temptation to do rather than to be. I hope you see the similarities here in terms of what Jesus faced in the wilderness compared to what Adam and Eve faced in the garden because it was the same temptation. So let's look at this. Matthew chapter 3, John baptizes Jesus and the father immediately affirms his identity. Remember the dove comes down, and the spirit of God comes down and says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And what's fascinating about this or what's telling about this, what's important for us to take away from that, um, from that action of the father is that he affirms the identity of Jesus. He tells them, I am, my, I am pleased in my son before Jesus even starts his ministry, before he does anything. And so immediately following that, in chapter 4, Jesus is tempted by the devil. And we read this, and, and, and listen to the wording of, of Scripture in this. It says, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to be bread. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you. And so this is the devil challenging Jesus about his identity. and says, if you are the Son of God. All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship you. This is the temp same temptation you and I face, which is to define ourselves based on what we do rather than who we are. And so we saw this with Eve when he says, if you do this, you shall be like God or you shall be like him. When in fact, Adam and Eve were already created like him. This is the same temptation that Christ faced in the wilderness when he says, if you are the son of God, if you do these things, you will, be, um, you will be like him. And so we see the emphasis here under the law or under the temptation, under the deceit for us to try and do something to affirm our identity when in fact we are already created in the image of God. The grace of God allows us to say, I am because God did something for me and not because something that I do. The fourth point is this, is that whoever God is, is your true identity. And so you have to stretch yourselves, as Rose said, to be able to grasp this principle. So we are in him and he is in us. Then it is the father's good pleasure that we take on and our identity becomes the true character of who he is. When we look at scripture and we see the nature of the father demonstrated through Jesus, we see the identity of who we really are. It's his nature. His nature becomes our nature. Remember the scripture that says, when we look in the mirror, we see ourselves, we see him. We see with unveiled eyes, the true nature and the true identity that we are. And that is the nature of our father. Point number five is this, is seeing Jesus and what he accomplished by grace brings a transition to our understanding into sonship. Look at the progression of these scriptures in Hebrews chapter two. In verse eight, it says this, God put all 
in subjection under man, but now yet we do not yet see all things under him. Verse 9 says, But we see Jesus, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. And then verse 10 says, For it is fitting for him, for whom all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory. And so we see this progression. We go from not seeing all things under mankind to seeing Jesus and what he did to seeing our identity of sonship with God. It says that it was fitting for him, which means it was the right thing for us to be in sonship. We are one with Christ, born of the Father. Grace shows us our identity of sonship of God. And then our final point today is this, is that grace cleanses our consciousness, bringing us from I am what I do to I am what I am. And this is so powerful. We are brought into the glory of sonship through grace. It is through grace that we understand the true God. And when we understand and when we see the true God, then we come to understand our true sonship. We understand ourselves and our identity of who we are, which is the Son of God, becomes clear to us. And so, family, we hope this blesses you. There's so much goodness in this. And us understanding, coming to the understanding of our identity, us truly seeing who we were created to be, not through the process of what we do, but rather through the process of what Jesus accomplished and the freedom that comes through the grace of God. I hope this blesses you. Meditate on this this week. Let it to continue to come back up in your spirit as the Spirit of God shows you this and brings this to your remembrance as you move through the week. God bless you, family. Before we leave uh, today, I want to remind you, those of you that are in our Southwest region here in Florida, we're doing another regional gathering for our local groups that can come and visit with us. And so that is coming up quickly on December 20th, you would have gotten an email by now. So please look for that email. Let us know that you're coming. It's going to be an awesome time um, of fellowship for our body here um, that we celebrate our time together. And so please respond. Let us know that you'll be here so we can plan accordingly. And for all of those of you that are part of our community, we want you to know that we love you. We're praying for you. And we'll see you next week as we continue on with this. God bless you.